Hi everyone. Uh, good evening. Um, so I am Ellie, I am Ellie Berkison, and um, I'd like to I like to tell you that this is uh, this is a unique experience for me. Um, though, so though I I teach on Zoom every day, so I'm familiar with this technology. I hope I don't mess it up. Uh, furthermore, I. Um, I've, I've given you know public shiurim, public classes all over the place. Although it's not so, it's not so often that I give, I guess what we could call a public class over Zoom. This is a common. This is a, a colliding of two worlds in a way that I'm not really used to. So with that, I'd like to I'd like to, to invite you to at any point during the shiur, uh, please you could actually you could actually raise your hand a lot. I might not see you on camera. You can use a hand raise feature or just shout something out or text me or whatever question or whatever you have, whatever you like uh, as we go along. Um, I hope you all have uh, the source sheet, which uh, Alana sent out, which I'll be using throughout. I'll be sharing my screen to try to, uh, just in case you, you can't access it. So um, and a reminder also that last night was the 29th day of the Omer. That was last night. So, um, so uh, a, a young boy, say nine or 10 years old, uh, goes to his father. Uh, he's a curious, he's a curious young fellow. And he says, and he says, Abba, where do human beings come from? The, the father, um, the father kind of understood the, what, what the, the rest of the question. And he said, well, on the sixth day, God decided to create Adam and Chava, create Adam and Eve. He created he created human beings in the image of God, and he saw that it was very good. So the boy was satisfied, went to sleep. The next morning was still a bit bothered. So he turned to went to, went to his mother. He said, Ima, um, where do human beings come from? And his, and, his, and his mother said, well, you know, it really started a couple billions of years ago. There was so the first, the first life the first life form single cell life form and then fast forward a long time eventually there were monkeys and from the monkeys developed the australopithecines and then homo erectus down to homo sapiens and that's where humans come from the boy the boy was his curiosity was peaked but he went to slip back to sleep the next morning he went to his father because he was troubled and he said abba i, I don't understand you told me that God created human beings. And then just yesterday, Ema told me that human beings come from monkeys. Which one is it? And the father said, oh, it's, it's not a problem at all, son. You see, I was talking about my side of the family. Your mother was talking about hers. Now, I realize that might be a, a risque joke um, in, this, uh, in this company. <laughs> uh, I, I, I say this merely as a way of, of showing that um, <laughs> I say this merely as a way of showing that the same phenomenon can be understood in many different ways. That's really what this comes down to. That, um, and in fact, you can look at things more from a textual perspective, from a historical perspective, or you can look things, look at things a bit more uh, from, you can say, a mystical perspective. And that's really what this comes down to uh, right here. So in this class here, I would like to investigate, um, I'd like to investigate Lag Omer, the 33rd day of the Omer. And um, I, want to I want to address three categories of questions. Okay, before we get into the sources, I want to address three categories of questions. So number one, what are the origins of Lag Omer? As in, what, why do we have some kind of mi minor holiday on this day? Number two, in a related way, what is the character of this day? And, and with that also, like, what, are the pro what are the potential problems with certain understandings of the history of Lagba Omer? And then number three, um, a methodological point at the end, um, and that is, what do we do when the origins of a holiday are perhaps in question. What does that tell us about Jewish tradition in general? Okay, so the um, that's those are the three basic questions I want to address along the way. And again, please, I reiterate: if you have if you have questions, if you have problems, if you have anything like that, please just tell me. 
um, in one way or another, you can just turn on your microphone and shut it up. So I hope you'll have the source sheet. I want to address, I want to begin with source number one. And, and by the way, as I'm going along, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make known where I even get all these ideas. I do not claim that all of these ideas are mine. Um, and, um, and hopefully we'll be able to understand the, the basic, the core texts for this um, as we go along. Okay. All right. So everyone ready? All right. Um, okay. So I think I see some, uh, some nodding of heads. All right. So we'll move on. So the outlandish origins of, of Longville Omer, I call it. So it all begins with a, with a source number one. Now, those of us who know a little bit about Lagba Omer, we probably, we are, we are probably told of one of two, or maybe both, origins of Lagba Omer. So one source, origin we have for this is that it comes from Rebbe, has something to do with Rebbe Akiva's students. Okay, so here we are, source number one, uh, this is the story of Rebbe Akiva's students. Now this, this story um, is taking place um, at some point uh, at the end, let's say the end of the first century, we get past being the second, second, second century CE. Okay, so I'll read and then pause and then read and pause. So Rebbe Akiva Omer, so this is source number one at the top. Rebbe Akiva Omer, he quotes a pasuk from, from Kohelet, that's Ecclesiastes. Okay, so Rabbi Akiva understood this pasuk in Masechet Kohelet as saying, just as you learn Torah when you're young, so too you learn Torah when you're old. Just as you learn Torah, just as you have students when you're young, so too you have students when you're old. And by the way, um, we're also going to see later on, this, this is also a source um, for um, the, the notion of having children, even, in, even when one's older. Okay, but uh, then he continues, Amu shnai masar elef zugim tamidim hayulo the Rebbe Akiva, migvat beradantipatos. Okay, so the, the sages say by way of example, to kind of to prove that Rabbi Akiva holds by this idea, that he had 12,000 pairs of students. He had 12,000 pairs of students um, who all died, um, who all died um, from, from Givat to Antipatris. So Antipatris or Antipros, that's in the center of Eretz Yisrael. So in, I guess you could say near modern day Tel Aviv, from Givat all the way to, all the, way to the northern extreme. So over the whole length of the, of the geography of Eretz Yisrael, he lost all these students. We're going to get into a, a little bit um, what this could mean. 12,000 pairs of students. So that's, that's 12,000 chavrutas, 24,000 students. That's an awful lot. We might discuss a little, have time to discuss a little bit how this could be. So back to the source. The kulam metu echad mipnei shelo nahagu and they all died over one time period uh, because they did not show kavod to one another. Okay, um, you teach, you mention, you teach this, you teach this to a to a middle schooler. Um, they'll be afraid for just like a few seconds. Like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be smacking my chavruta. Um, um, but then, it, it, eventually, this is, the message sinks in. Okay, but they're scared for a second. Now they didn't show kavod to one another. Okay, um, all right. What to do with that? We'll figure out. The Haya Halam Shamem Ad Shabar Rabbi Akiva Atzal Vavotein Shabadavon Vishana Lahem. Okay, and the world was desolate. It was Shamem. It was empty of Torah until Rabbi Akiva went to our rabbis in the south. So the south does not mean um, Elat, like the south of, of modern day Eretz Yisrael. Elat, by the way, it, it's, quite, it's a bit of complicated whether you consider Elat all the way in the south on the Red Sea to be biblical Israel. Um, but the south means, you know, just north of the Negev Desert. And he, he taught new students. Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yosei, Rabbi Shimon, Bar, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Elazar ben Shamoa, v'hem hem heimidu Torah utasha. So he lost these first group of students. So then, as he, keeping to his uh, word, you could say, that one should have students in one's old age, as he was aging, 
He taught at least five more key students, including the five listed here. Rabbi Shimon is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Bar Yochai, that's the famous Bar Yochai of Lagba Omer. We'll be getting into him. Okay? And um, they sustained Torah, but Oto Sha'ah at that time. Sha'ah means hour, but it means that for that you know, hour in history, he was able to sustain Torah. Okay? So he taught new students. Okay, Utana, the last bit of the story, Kula Metu Mi Pesach Now, this is where it really concerns us. So, the Gemara adds that they died between Pesach and Shavuot. That Tzeret means Shavuot. So, in other words, over a period of the Omen. Vama Rabbi Chama Bar Rav Chama Bar Abba, the Itema Rabbi Chia Bar Avin. So, then Rav Chama Bar Abba, some say it was Rabbi Chia Bar Avin, Kula Metu Mi my my he Amar Rabbi Nachman Askara. What? How did they die? It was uh, it was by it was from a plague, a disease called Azkara, which could be diphtheria or, or other, th or it could be something else, some kind of uh, plague which affects which affects the breathing. The idea being they didn't show respect to one another with their mouths. Therefore, that's what struck them. That part of the body was struck in this plague. Now. <coughs> You look at this source, and um, the first thing which would be jumping up at you, Rabbi Berkison, we're missing something. And what is it that we're missing here? Well, I'll Lagba ask you. Omer. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you very much, Mr. Rizal. Yes, we're missing any mention of Lagba Omer. There's no mention of the 33rd day. We mentioned the Omer, Pesach to Shavuot, but nothing about Lagba Omer. This, when you read, and now, if you just encountered this story um, in the Gemara itself, without any background, you wouldn't necessarily be troubled by this. But in, the, in my introduction here, you, will be, you should be troubled, because I am saying this has something to do with Lagba Omer, and the commentators will too. But how? It doesn't say anything with the Lagba Omer, the 33rd day. And I, I'm not withholding anything from you. This, this, is really the whole, this is really the whole story. Okay? So first of all, so our first major source here our first major source is this, this story, Rabbi Kiva. You've probably heard before this notion that, um, that uh, Lag Omer is a celebration of some kind of revival of Torah after Rabbi Kiva's students died. Um, but it's not clear at all from the text what this has to do with Lag Omer. Next, source number, so next, a bit, another introductory source before we get into the real answer. So first I want to talk, I want to, as we're discussing the origins of the Lagba Omer, at first we have to know the basic Talmudic sources. Okay. Now, another basic Talmudic source here is source number three. Now, I just gave you part of this from Shabbat Lamed Gimel Amud Bet. This is a whole story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. I just gave you a small snippet of it. I cut off the beginning, I cut off a lot at the end. Um, uh, you may have heard the story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Now, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was Rabbi, one of Rabbi Akiva's students. The basic idea was um, the, there was a, a meeting. There was a, a meeting of Jews, and the um, the Jews were a group, a group of rabbis and Jews were praising the uh, the Roman emperor for all that they've done for us. Um, as a as an as a as an aside um, into secular wisdom, that beginning of that story about uh, Shimon Bar Yochai is I don't, I don't quite know the connections here. I'll admit that I'm a bit lost, but those of you who are a bit familiar with Monty Python um, know that um, that story, what have the Romans done for us? Um, th that story is, is really like, it's, is, very much reflect, is very much reflected in Lamed Gimel Lamed Bet, the beginning in, um, uh, in this story about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. As in, what have the Romans done for us? And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, oh, everything they did for us, was really just to serve them and to serve their idolatry. And in other words, whatever benefit we have from the Roman Empire, um, it was not done out of some kind of benevolence. It was done because the Romans wanted to aggrandize themselves and we happened to piggyback on that. And as a result, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, after he insults the Roman Empire, then he has to run into hiding. He has to run into hiding. Um, and then we, the story picks up um, right here, the bit that I give you, um, where he and his son Elazar went to study in the Beit, went to hide in the Beit Midrash, 
they felt that that still wasn't safe. Um, so they went and hid in a cave and a miracle occurred and a carob tree brought them sustenance and, um, and, and the spring of water. And then Eliyahu Navi came. Um, so, and there's a whole, uh, we could spend many hours on this story alone. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of juicy stuff in there. But what I really want to point out here for us is what, what you might think is a tremendous coincidence. After all, what is the daf number for this story? Lamed Gimel, 33. How could it be that the story about Lagba Omer, like one of the two quintessential stories about Lagba Omer um, in the Talmud Bavli, is just so happens to be on daf Lamed Gimel, daf 33? How could that be? Could that be a coincidence? So um, anyone know? Anyone know why that, how that could be? So the short answer is, it, it, it's probably not a coincidence. I mean, so I, I, I just want to show you like one quick book, which I used kind of called a printing. You see, that's a bit blur. Can't quite see it. Oh, hold on a second. Hold on. I, mean, I, 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 can, I can figure this out. I'm technologically savvy. Um, there we go. Oh, printing the Talmud. There you go. This book, Printing the Talmud, published by Yeshiva University Museum. Um, so printing the Talmud, um, this book, among others, points out that the daf numbering in Talmud Bavli um, is, is relatively recent. I mean, I, I, I'm, I, don't, I haven't investigated it in enough detail, but surely um, the, um, the daf, call it that that's Gemara from Mesechet Shabbat, daf Lamed Gimel, um, it would not have been daf Lamed Gimel any time before the late 15th century for sure. Um, the, the current Vilna Shas, the Vilna edition of Shas, which we have now, which is the, the layout we have on our shelves in your average baby drash, that only goes back to, that only goes back about 150 years. That's not that old at all. But um, the idea of having a daf number didn't even exist before the late 15th century. <coughs> so this is all to say that, um, that the printers um, probably at some point I mean, I'm just theorizing. There's a strong likelihood that the printers arranged for that story to be on Daf Lamed Gimel, if I had to guess. Now, you could say that Hashem has his hand in this because in order for them to do that, it could mean if that story was at the very beginning of Masechet Shabbat, at the very end, this, that wouldn't have been possible. It had to have been somewhere in that neighborhood, in the end of the first third of Masechet Shabbat for that to work. But that's fine. You can, you can, that's fine. But I just want to point out that that story is on Daf Lamed Gimel, probably not by coincidence. Okay, so where are we? We have a, we have a story about Rabbi Akiva where we're not told, uh, where we're not even told anything about Lagba Omer, and we have a story about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and Bar Yochai is one of the central characters of Lagba Omer, and his story appears on Daf Lamed Gimel. But still, but still, we have no, we're told nothing about where Lagba Omer comes from, okay? Now this, now, now we begin into our real investigation of what are the origins of Log Britain. Okay, so you all with me here? Okay. Quick check-in. All right. Now, the first major source is source number four, Menachem, Rav Menachem HaMeiri from Provence. Okay? From Provence, you see his dates there. He was roughly contemporary with the Ramban, with Nachmanides. Now, Menachem HaMeiri, um, his, we're going to see here, this is, as far as I know, perhaps the earliest written record we have of a, of a holiday on the 33rd day of the Omer. As far as the earliest written record we have, as far as I know. Okay? And not only that, but Rav Menachem HaMeiri, the Beit HaBichira, his commentary on Talmud Bavli, um, was lost for many hundreds of years. So a lot of the other, a lot of the later Rishonim and early Acheronim, so the time before and after the Shulchan Aruch, they didn't even have, they didn't even have access to the Me'iri. So um, the Me'iri, he's commenting on Masechet Yevamot, the whole story of Rabbi Akiva. And then, um, and then he picks up, um, and then he, pick, uh, I, he picks up where I put the, uh, the words, you know, I'll highlight it here in blue. He, these are the words in, uh, that I made large, okay? 
And he says, the students who are mentioned here, Shekula made to be Pesach Veadat who died from, from Pesach to Shavuot, the Kabbalah Beyad Geurinim Shebeyom Lag Beomer Pascha Amita. So there's a tradition, a Kabbalah. Here, Kabbalah just means tradition. There's a tradition in the hand of the Geonim. Now, Geonim, I get you would think usually refers to the rabbis of the Geonic period in Bavel, right after the period of the Talmud. It, it's more likely here that Meiri means his his uh, his predecessors. So I said forefathers, his predecessors. Um, um, it's more likely what it means because otherwise I'm not sure Meiri is really known to rely so much on Geonic tradition. But so he says his predecessors say that on the 33rd day of the Omer, the dying stopped. So we have a custom as a result to not fast on that day, not a, not a voluntary fast. And so too, we don't have weddings over that time period. Okay? So, the Me'iri is merely saying, there's a tradition, I don't know where from, there is some tradition that a log, the Omer, the dying stopped, all the 12,000 pairs of students stopped dying, um, and therefore, we don't fast, we probably, we, you could probably, probably assume, we probably didn't say Tachanun either, and we don't have weddings from Pesach until Lag Ba'omer. Okay, which is a cut, which of course is a widely spread custom. Now, um, that's the Mi'iri. Um, as far as I know, that's the earliest source we have for that, for that, for that custom. And on top of that, as I was saying, the Mi'iri, um, a, lot of us, a lot of people didn't have his commentary until relatively recently. Okay, so that's interesting. So, um, so raise your hand if you've heard this story before, that the dying stopped on Lagba Omer. Anyone, you raise your hand for the fear of that one before? Okay, that, that's probably one of the two more common stories we hear for Lagba Omer. Now I introduce you to the second. The second common um, hit origin we have for Lagba Omer is the next source. Rabbi Chaim Vital. Okay, Rav Chaim Vital, um, who was a student of the Arizal, the student of Rav, a student of Rav Yitzchak Luria Ashkenazi, the Arizal. Um, you say he was, you see, he was born in Italy and died in Syria, but he lived most of his life in Tzfat. He was really associated with Tzfat in the north of Israel. Rav Chaim Vital. Now, again, now this, again, as far as I know, is the first written record of. Um, Shimon Bar Yochai's connection to this holiday. Now, because the Arizal most certainly had a tradition of celebrating Shimon Bar Yochai, but he actually did not write down very much. His students wrote down most of his teachings. Now, this is, this is firmly from the realm of Kabbalah. If you read closely these words, you'll see that this is, this is really very Kabbalistic, very mystical. So nowadays, he's writing now, he's writing this probably the early 1600s. He says, well, people who go to the grave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Rabbi Elazar, his son, in Meron and Lagba Omer, in the town of Meron, near Tzfat, in the north of Israel, on the 33rd day of the Omer, I saw my teacher, the Arizal, eight years ago, Shehalach in Ishtovim Beto, who went with his wife and children, Vahayasham Gimel Yamim Hayim, and he was there for three days. By the way, it's a custom we observe today. A lot of people who, when they go to Meron for Lagba Omer, they stay there for a few days. Vigam Heid Li Haris, and so too testified to me um, Rav Yonatan Sagis, another student of the Arizal. A year before I met the Arizal, who went with his son and had a great party and a simcha and cut his hair there in Meron. Who cut his hair there in Meron. That hair cutting ceremony we call a an upshern or, or a chalake. Okay? Chalake in Israel. Okay? So, um, Again, this is also observed today. But now, now in, the, in, the, in the smaller print, which I didn't translate for you, he gets into like really Kabbalistic stuff. Um, just to go through quickly, 
he says that um, he says in there, I'll just paraphrase that uh, testified to him, Rabbi, I think Rav Avraham Halevi, Rav Reish, I think it was Rav Avraham Halevi, this Avraham Halevi who had a custom of since Yerushalayim was destroyed to say a Birkat uh, Tachanonim, to put in, to put into the Shmona Esrei every single day, some laments for Yerushalayim, kind of like what we say on Tisha B'Av, and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and then the Rabbi, and then, and then someone told uh, Rabbi Chaim Vital in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, uh, and Shimon Bar Yochai uh, about this. And in the make a long story short, um, this fellow who was mourning Yerushalayim, he was mourning Yerushalayim also on Lag Baomer, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's yard site. And as a result, as a result, um, as a result, he he had a death death in the family. So. Um, <laughs> In other words, he disrespected Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's yard site, so he had a death in the family. I mean, so that's very Kabbalistic. I'm not going to get into that. Um, I don't understand that. But, but then he goes but then back to the bigger prince. He says, Vitam Shemet Rashbi Bayom Lag Omer. And the reason for this holiday is that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai died on Lag Omer. That's his yard site. Okay. And he was one of the students of Rabbi Akiva, Shemetu Bisfirat Omer, who died on Lag Omer. Now, is Rabbi Chaim Vital saying that? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was one of the students who died on Lag Omer, or died who died with the twelve thousand. I, I don't think so. I think it's just the punctuation is a bit weird. The word of is a bit weird. But he's saying that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai um, was one of Rabbi Kiva's students, and his yard site is Lag Omer. Okay, so number two, have you heard this before? That Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's yard site is Lag Omer. Heard that idea before? Is that that's not new to you? Okay, great. Um, so again, it's a very common tradition um, on Lag, for Lag Omer, but um, its roots really are in Simo. The first written record we have of this is in this mystical Kabbalistic source from Chaim Vital. Otherwise, I don't, I'm not sure where else it comes from. Okay, so already, already, if you are a shtickle of shtickle historian, you're already getting a bit suspicious because. Here we don't hear about we don't hear about Rabbi Kiva's students or the death of the students stopping um, until we get to Rabbi Menachem Amiri, um, a, thir a, a 13th, uh, 13th century Rishon, and we don't hear about the yard site of Lag Omer until Rabbi Chaim Vital in the uh, 1600s. So if you're a historian, you're thinking, well, uh, is this holiday legitimate? I mean, what, what is this? Our, our our Jewish holidays, look, every holiday we have, we can, we, we can, we can trace its, source, its origins. Either it's in Chumash, or it's somewhere else in Tanakh, like, like Tisha B'Av or, 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 or Purim, or, we, we, or it's mentioned in, in Talmud Bavli, like Hanukkah, or it's a more modern holiday for the modern state of Israel. We're, we're able to trace all of these holidays. We know exactly where they come from, except for Lag Omer. Already in these sources, we're, we're just, we're told that we have an oral tradition, but what it's all about. But that's it. Okay. So, and, and and not only that, not only do we not really know where it comes from, but there are even bigger problems. So let's go to source number six, the pre Chadash, Rav Chizkia da Silva. Um, the pre the pre Chadash. Now pre Chadash, um, really like I asked the question very strongly, and he goes and he says. Um, he says, uh, So it, it is one to be precise and ask about this joy, this simcha, this this occasion. Lama, why? And if it's because they simply stop dying, So what? Hari lo lisharu echad mehen v'kula metu umati voshel simcha zo. As I translate this here, not one of them survived. They all died. What kind of joy is this? We're going to have a big simcha, kind of a yom tov, because the students simply stopped dying? That's it? And he says, Oh, the Fshar she simcha hi alo tam tamidim she hosi, rahakaf rabbi akiva shalom metu ke'elu. Okay, so it's, a, it's possible that the joy is for the students who Rabbi Akiva added afterwards. He added like Rabbi Shimon Marichai and others, they did not die. But really, I mean, of all the occasions to have a simcha, Simply because they didn't die, that doesn't, that doesn't seem that does, doesn't seem to fit the joy which is often associated with with Lag Omer, all the bonfires and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't quite seem to. Now it's a nice message. 
that the students didn't show respect to one another. Therefore, we have to, therefore we have to recognize. We have to, um, um, therefore we have to, we have to teach the story. But I don't know. Says the pre chadash, doesn't seem like a good reason to have a holiday. And then furthermore, number source number seven from Yo 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 Yosef Kara, the Shulchan Aruch, who uh, from Spain originally went to Tzfat. A lot of Tzfat, a lot of Tzfat going on here. Now the, now the Shulchan Aruch goes on, goes on to say that, goes on to list right here in Orachim. So this is your standard Shulchan Aruch, which you will have on your shelf, which we use as a, as a code for Jewish law. And he lists days on which there were big calamities, Tzarot, and on these days we fast. Okay? And, and then he goes, sorry, then you see, and I, I give you a snippet of um, Sif, of Sif Bet, and he lists a few of these fasts, the first of Nisan, the tenth of Nisan, um, Chavav, Chavav Nisan, Kit Yoshua ben Nun Mind. So I mentioned here the, the yard site of Rabbi Yoshua ben Nun, which is the 26th of Nisan, um, the second. That, so I, I keep that in mind for later. Um, but I bring this to show you, but wait a minute here. Furthermore, you know, really the tradition of the Shulchan Aruch is that on a yard site, what do we do? We don't have bonfires and play with bows and arrows and go dance around in Meron. On a, on, a, on a yard site, we fast. That's what the Shulchan Aruch says. Now, there certainly is a long-standing custom of having a Kiddush and stuff like that um, on, on a yard site, but the original custom was to fast on a yard site. So why would we have some big hilula, a big to-do, on a yard site of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai when the tradition, the ancient tradition, it seems to be to fast, what's going on? So on the one, so one of the customs doesn't seem kind of a uh, overwrought, and another custom just doesn't seem to fit the usual tradition. What's going on here? You hear the problem? This is a problem. And um, so, as a result, um, some other, some other later, some other sources came up with, um, or one source in particular came up with one possible uh, solution. So this is source number eight. Now, the next two sources, I did not see inside. I, I, I did not find the text for these myself. I heard, I, I heard these um, in a shiur from uh, Rabbi Dr. Schneer Lyman um, at Yeshiva University, the great historian. And so he pointed, he pointed out these two sources, which I could not find uh, myself. And um, so I take, it, I take it on his word. Uh, that these are what the sources say, and uh, I think he's a quite reliable himself. So I, I have every reason to believe that if, if Dr. Schnell Lyman uh, points points these out as as real sources, then I'll, then they are real sources. Um, so source number eight is the Chida of Chaim Yosef David Azulai uh, from Yerushalayim, and eventually um, he passed away when he was traveling in Italy, actually. And um, he the Chida has a kind of a, modifies the story a little bit to try to come up with a more palatable explanation about why we have, why we have Lagba Omer. Um, and, and, by the, and it also relates a little bit, I suppose, to what the pre Chadash says. He says, Ma shosim simcha ben Lagba Omer. So this whole jo the whole notion of having a big joyous occasion on Lagba Omer. Bayom Lagba Omer, he tchilish not, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Yochai, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yossi. That on Lagba Omer, he, who would be Rabbi Akiva, began to teach Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yossi, and others. In other words, it's not that Lagba Omer is the day that they stop dying, the students stop dying, and it's not that it's anyone's yard site in particular, it's that this is the day on which Rabbi Akiva revived the Torah, started teaching Torah again to the new students. That's really what it's all about. Um, so that, that would be our third possible origin for Log Bohemian. It's the day that these, they started to teach these students, um, which sounds nice, which sounds a bit more like a, a joyous occasion. But again, I, it, as with all of these sources, I, we don't really have any other explanation any earlier than this. Like this is, we don't see this, this idea of, of a day of re reviving the Torah. We don't see that really anywhere else. We don't see that written down anywhere else. Now, but it does fit with the Gemara a little bit. I mean, the, the Gemara does say that um, that 
that these students upheld Torah at that time. It says that we use the word Sha'a as an hour, as a way of saying that there was a, perhaps that perhaps the word, the word Sha'a indicates there was a, a real moment, a real occasion when the Torah began to be retaught. So it, it, it's, it fits the Gemara a little bit. I mean, it's, but again, we just don't know. It doesn't say that anywhere that, 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 that Lagba Omer is really this. And then also source number nine, this is, this is also very curious. Now, this is from the Cairo Geniza. Um, this, uh, from the Cairo Geniza, it dates to the 7th to 8th century CE. Um, the, um, um, if you want to, there's a, a lot to be said about the Cairo Geniza. The Cairo Geniza, for those who don't know, um, it was first, I think it was first discovered by Europeans in the 1750s. Basically, there's a storeroom, a storeroom in the Ben Ezra synagogue um, in Fustat in Old Cairo um, had all kinds of ancient, ancient materials in it, um, dating back, dating back centuries, if even millennia. And um, it was, for some reason, it was left untouched, relatively untouched for a very long time. And in the 1750s, Europeans began to first, I think, first found it. Um, and uh, really, but really, it was only in the 1890s that uh, Western researchers really started to delve into those materials. Like a, a good um, account of that would be uh, like in this book here, you know, Sacred Trash, which I have here in my shelf. That's a picture of Solomon Schechter, the, one of the earlier, one of the early Cairo Geniza researchers going through uh, the materials in that Geniza. Um, and, um, and so again, Dr. L Dr. Lehman points out that there is, that there is a fragment uh, let me put, put this back on the screen. There's a fragment in the Geniza, which is relevant to us. And that's this fragment here, which says, source number nine. It says, So these are the fast days that we have every month. The Shulchan Aruch, you see, er, remember earlier, source number seven lists these fast days. And there's one really curious deviation here. In the Cairo Geniza, we find a fragment from the 7th or 8th century which says, Bishmona Sarba Iyar met Yoshua bin Nun. On the 18th of Iyar, Yoshua bin Nun died. The 18th of Iyar is Lag Baomer. Now you'll notice the source number seven in the Shulchan Aruch today, it says that you'll be have on our shelves, Yoshua bin Nun died on the 26th of Nisan. <coughs> Only a few weeks apart. Um, 26th of Nisan and 18th of Iyar. Um, that's curious. So according to this, actually, uh, Lag Omer should be a fast day. So the earliest source we have that mentions the 33rd day of the Omer says it's a fast day to, to commemorate, to, to memorialize Yoshua ben Nun. But now, maybe we should take that source of a grain of salt. Now, why do you think? I mean, if you had to guess, why might a person be a bit suspicious of this source from the Cairo Geniza, if you had to guess? Not knowing anything more about it. Well, who wrote it? I mean... Yeah. I don't know. Who wrote it? And is it a mistake? I mean, it is a Geniza after all, right? A Someone Geniza is, is where you put stuff, a lot of stuff that you want to throw away. Maybe a scribe made a mistake. I don't know. The truth is, I don't know. Um, Dr. Lehman did not indicate that he knew. We, we just have this snippet. So it's interesting because it's the earliest written source we have for Log Baomer. But who knows? Who knows what to make of it? I don't know what to make of it. Um, it it's the Shulchan Aruch later on listed Yeshua bin Nun's Yerzai as being on a different day. Um, but okay, I mean, in the end, though, an early source might be more authoritative. I don't know. I'm not really sure. I'm not sure what to make of it. But um, it is, however, our fourth, our fourth source for Lag Baomer. Um, now, okay. Um, so, but then, okay. So now, now we continue on this journey to find sources for Lag Baomer. Now, um, and then we get to so answer number five is perhaps the most amusing, but also the least satisfying. Um, this is from Rav Moshe Sofer, the Chatam Sofer, the Chassam Sofer, the great Pressburger Rav, who was originally from Frankfurt, 
and made his career really in Pressburg, in what was then Hungary. It's now Bra and Pressburg is now Bratislava, the capital of Slovakia. If you look on a map, you'll see that Bratislava is just a couple hundred miles from Hungary, modern day Hungary. Now, the Khatam Sofer, in the, the first little bit of this chuva, this is a response that he had. He describes how people would go to Tzfat and they would light candles and they would dance on Lagba Omer. Um, in Ir HaKodesh Tzfat, he says, in Lagba, they have a big Hilula, Hilula de Rashbi, to have a big, a big uh, festival, a yard site festival, you could call it, for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And um, but but he 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 says he doesn't know anything he doesn't he doesn't know much about it it's not it's not really his thing um, but he, he doesn't know why people do it but more importantly he says right here the, I so circled him in blue aval liboa moed shelo naso banes lo huskar b'shasu poskim b'shum makom however to fix a festival on which there occurred no miracle and it's not mentioned in the Babylonian Talmud or in any of the commentators, in nowhere. That the, um, the fact that there is a hint to it indicates that one should not eulogize on this day and one should not have a voluntary fast day. Um, and this would be a custom. So he says, this holiday as is not mentioned anywhere in the Babylonian Talmud, in the commentators. He's not aware of any miracle that happened on that day. We merely have a custom to not eulogize and to not fast because there's a hint to it. Now, this is going to be important. But now, the Khatam Sofer is a major figure. If he says, I don't know where this comes from, that carries a lot of weight. He knew a lot. And he says, I have no idea where this holiday comes from. Vitama gufa loyadana. And the reason for this holiday, I simply do not know. Okay? He simply doesn't know. Um, and one shouldn't be surprised he doesn't know. As we've been going through these sources, I've been mean, going through these sources, first of all, the Khatam Sofer probably didn't even have the Me'iri. The Me'iri was still lost at that time. Um, as far as Rabbi Chaim Vital, I'm not sure the Khatam Sofer would have given that much credence from a historical perspective. Now, we're going to see a bit of the Khatam Sofer does have some kind of Kabbalistic roots a little bit. We're going to get into that a little bit. But when he says, I don't know where this comes from, that means that the sources we normally use to determine what our holidays are, he doesn't know what it's all about. Um, okay, so I'll pause here and say that our first goal was to list a few of the origins of Lagba Omer. We have, first, the Me'iri says it's when Rabbi Akiva's students stopped dying. Rabbi Chai Vital says it's Rabbi, the Yard said Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. The Chida says it's the day when Rabbi Akiva started to teach new students. N number four was the Cairo Geniza, very puzzling, says it's the Rabbi Yoshua bin, it's Yoshua bin Nun's uh, Yard site. And in source number five, from the Khatam Sofer is who knows? Who knows where this comes from? I have no idea. It's um, there's a custom to go to Tzfat. I see people doing it, um, but I don't know why. I don't know why. Okay, um, so everything's clear as mud, right? Now, um, but now I want I want to I want to take a moment to point out that um, there are there are serious advantages. My my, my second goal was to address kind of the character of the day. Now. We already have a couple of, we already have one reason for it to be just a really over the top holiday. That's Rabbi Chaim Vital. Um, I guess that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's yard site. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, even in that story I said, that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai struck in his, from Shemaim somehow struck down someone who disrespected his yard site. Okay, I mean, if for, if for no other reason out of sheer fear, make sure, make sure you celebrate. Okay, I mean, but so the first reason, the first character is that it's a really, really joyous, mystical day of unification with some departed soul. That's one. But the, 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 the obvious problem with that holiday is we don't normally 
have that kind of holiday. It's just not the kind of thing that we're, we don't really hear about this outside of Kabbalistic circles. Number two is, is that it's some kind of, it marks an important positive time in history. So like the Meiri, that the students stopped dying, or like the Chida, that Rabbi Kiva started teaching new people. In other words, it's kind of more, number two is it's kind of more of a toned down day to kind of celebrate either the survival of Torah, you could say. Um, that, so that's also a good reason to, to celebrate, but perhaps in a more toned down fashion. Um, and then sorry, but, but a third way of seeing it, um, well, so it's possibly from the Cairo Geniza that it's, a, that it's a yard site, and that if it's a yard site, then you observe it as you would in a normal yard site. But now, the problem with that, though, is that we, we're not aware anywhere of Lag Ba'omer being a day actually of solemnity and sadness, like how, like how the Shulchan Aruch describes a fast day, so or a yard site, sorry. So we could see Lag Ba'omer as that, but we, don't, we only have one potentially unreliable source which tells us about that. Um, and, and surrounding all of this, we have the Khatam Sofer, uh, the Chassam Sofer, who says that I'll, I'll agree to not fast on this day, but honestly, I don't know why. Um, but now I want to get to in the last, my last part of this year, I, I want to get into a more methodological point about how we view, a, a little bit about mystical sources. Because now, the Khatam Sofer in source number 10, um, he does say that there is a remiza. A remez remiza. <coughs> I'll highlight that for you. Um, there is a hint to um, this holiday. And if you read the rest of this chuva, if you read, read the rest of this chuva, and, and the Khatam Sofer is not easy to read. I didn't translate it for you because it is so difficult. Um, he discusses a little bit how people view the Kabbalistic origins of Lag Omer like Tiferet and Hod and all of these things, like the, the, the various Kabbalistic Sfirot. Now, he's not saying that's the origins, that's why he thinks Lag Omer is a holiday. It's not why. He's, he's saying that that's how, how people view it. But I want to point out that there's something kind of puzzling in the writings of the Khatam Sofer. So this is source, source number 11 and 12. Now, uh, this week's Parsha is Amor. Last week was Achrimot Kedoshim. Two weeks ago was Tazriya Mitzora. I came across this uh, just a couple of weeks ago for Parsha Tazriya Mitzora. And this was pointed out to me um, in a shir I heard from Rabbi Yoni Levin um, in uh, Woodmere, uh, Woodmere, New York. I heard it online. And he points out the, he points out the, um, um, the Khatam Sofer's commentary on a pasuk from Parsha, from Parsha Tazriya. The Pasuk says, Dalbera bene Israel Mor Isha ki Tazriya Vyada Zakar Vatan Shiva Yamim Kime Nidata Devota Tidma. Okay? It's talking about a woman who's giving birth. Now, but if you look carefully at the, the, uh, the timeline after giving birth, um, we get into some we get into some interesting numerology. Now so the Chatam Sofer says, "Isha ki tazriya v'gomer af al gav dehayinyan kipshuto." Okay, the isha mi mazret tichila yadal zachar. Okay, so even though the the um, the in the matter is as expressed, that is in nature a woman conceives first, gives birth to a boy. Okay, I says the od the od bo remez, but there is also an esoteric hint a remez. Okay, so first of all, the Chatam Sofer, good, as a good Litvak, uh, um, as a good Litvak, uh, and my yeshiva origins most certainly are very Litvak. So as a good Litvak, he must point out that the Pasuk means what you think it means. But there is something else. We're not, say, we're not in any way saying that the Pshat, the simple straightforward meaning is irrelevant here. It's very relevant. However, there's a lot more to it. And this, this is where we really get into the whole pardes, you know, pardes, uh, um, that uh, there's pshat, remez, drash, and sod. So there is some kind of, there is some kind of remez here. So he goes on to say, 
Now in the Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew, you skip down to, um, skip down to the Zohar Ita. And by the way, thank you everyone for not um, for not drawing on the annotation on when I share my screen um, as middle school middle school students are wont to do. So I appreciate that very much. Um, although it, it does make me feel a bit less at home, but I'll deal with it. Okay. Um, he says. Bezohar ita miyoma mila shematria on the Shama Hakedusha, Lichnos, Petoka Gufa Israeli, Enamita Shevet al Nakoma Rui ad Achar Lamed Gimo Yom. So in these Psukim, we, we, we hear mention of after 33 days, this is in the Psukim, 33 days, 33 days is some kind of re re return of purity. And he says, in the Zohar, is this interpretation, this is my own translation, if, if it's, it's, not, it's imperfect, that's my fault. From the day of the, of the Brit Milah, when the holy soul in the Kamen Shama Kedoshah begins to enter the Jewish body, it, the soul, does not settle in its suitable place until after the 33rd day. So it's like this. According to the Zohar, says the Khatam Sofer, again, the Khatam Sofer was a super duper litvak. A real, not, you do not normally associate him with being a Kabbalistic person. However, his, one of his Rebbeim, one of his teachers is Rabbi Nasson Adler, um, a German Kabbalist. Nowadays, those two words are contradictory. German and Kabbalist don't go together. They have not for a couple of hundred years. But back then, it, it was allowed. Back then, if you were a Yeke, if you were a German Jew, you were allowed to learn Kabbalah. Nowadays, no, 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 no. Nisht. Um, but, or nine. Okay? But he says that, that um, the, when a baby boy has a Brit Milah, the soul begins to, you could say, awaken. It, be it begins to enter the Jewish body, but the, the, but the soul does not completely settle until the 33rd day. And that's based on the Pesukim. Okay? And from this, one can understand one of the reasons for Lag Ba'omer. Nothing is by chance. I came across this just a couple of weeks ago, just a few weeks before Lag Ba'omer. Okay? Um, uh, as okay, so, so first of all, he's addressing on a, on a human level, that's when the soul enters the baby boy. And for this, we understand Lag Ba Omer because he goes on to say that um, Arba'im leoledet shehu gemar tahara. Say, so I, I translated it as saying, after the Jewish nation was circumcised on Erev Pesach in Egypt, the divine spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, did not settle in the nation until it found rest after the 32nd day of the Omer. In other words, they left Egypt and the Ruach HaKodesh, whatever that is, the divine spirit, did not settle in Am Yisrael until after the 32nd day, and on the 33rd day, it was like they were a fully formed, um, a fully formed, because after, if, you know, we, say, if we say a fetus begins to be, uh, take, take, take on the characters of the fetus after 40 days, on the 33rd day, it was as if it was a, it was viable offspring, the completion of its pur purification. Now that, now all this sounds very mystical. Most certainly it does, because it's the Zohar after all. This is the Katam Sofer quoting the Zohar. But now, let's go back. In that tshuva, in that response of the Khatam Sofer, where he's talking about um, that he doesn't know the origins of Lag Omer, but there is a remizu, there is a hint. If you ask me, right here in this commentary on Parsha Tazria, he is explaining to us much more in detailed fashion, what is that hint? This is the hint. The hint is right here, Parsha Tazria, or at least it's one possible. The idea is that Lag Ba is that Lag Ba we don't know the standard historical origins of Lag Ba Omer, but it seems to have some kind of hint in on a personal level in how a baby boy's neshama arrives, his gets in his body. It has some kind of hint in how Ruach Hakodesh entered Am Yisrael, entered the Jewish nation. But he doesn't know the historical origins. So this is to say that 
Uh, one can find this bit from the Zohar uh, inspiring or not. In, in my experience, this kind of stuff really inspires some people, and others um, find it kind of like heebie-jeebie. Um, I, I don't mean to make any make any light of uh, of the Zohar. That, that, that if the Khatam Sofer finds it important, then I'll find it important too. But um, I don't claim to always understand it. But my methodological point is this. Um, even the Khatam Sofer is very adamant that one should not go overboard in celebrating Lag Bahomer in that Shuva. He's very adamant that he really doesn't know where it comes from. And it's not always appropriate to do the really over the top celebrations that he sees. That being said, there is some hint to this holiday. In other words, the Khatam Sofer seems to be taking the view that um, I, in my historical, in my understanding of history, cannot explain the origins of everything. So back to my back to my back to my terrible joke at the beginning. Um, we cannot explain the origins of everything. It's just not possible. Um, we don't always understand fully how it is, we don't fully understand, either the scientists or the religious, no, no one, we don't fully understand everything about how human beings came to be. It doesn't all make sense. And so to hear, he's saying, the Khatam Sofer is saying that I'm willing to acknowledge this holiday, even though I really don't know where it comes from. But I think there is some hint to it in some deeper wisdom the remez, the remiza, the Torah tasod, the, the, you know, in, in, in modern Hebrew, they say Torah tasod, that means, means mystical wisdom, the mystical Torah. In Torah tasod, there is some kind of hint to it. And even the Litvaks have to admit that. Um, that but, but that means that we can't just dismiss Lagba Omer outright. There's something, there's something to be said about the fact that we have one holiday which is not spelled out to us by our Kabbalah. That seems, if you ask, if you ask me, and I'll and I'll wrap up with this, um, is if you ask me, the um, if there's one holiday where at least like we're being we're being asked to acknowledge that we do not know, that we do not know all the origins of our tradition, we don't know where all of this comes from. It's this, it's this one here. It's Lag Omer coming up. Um, and that's why, and that's perhaps getting to be why, in the mystical traditions, in Kabbalah, Lag Omer is a huge, huge deal. It's a huge deal. Um, because this is the message that um, in our tradition, we, we certainly base our, our day-to-day lives on, on Shas, Uposkim, Tanakh, on, on all the, on the things which make the, kind of the, the meat and potatoes of Jewish tradition, but there's something else there that was passed on orally for centuries, and we don't fully know all of it, and we have to accept that maybe it was just passed on orally for centuries, and that's, and that's why we can't trace it. Maybe that's also why we can't trace the origins of the Zohar so well. Um, um, the, uh, if you follow Zohar scholarship, Zohar scholarship is, is, uh, it's changed a lot over the decades. It's, it's at the point now where scholars have to admit there is, there seems to be, there are huge amounts of it which were passed down orally uh, for centuries. Um, and I forgot to mention at the beginning, but I'll mention now that, uh, so I find Lag Omer so significant, not only because it's a reminder that there is some oral mystical tradition that we just don't know so well. Um, it's also my oldest son's Hebrew birthday. <laughs> so um, that's also a big... Uh, a big deal for me, what made it interesting for me. Um, so if you talk about the origins of life, well, um, the, uh, so that, that, that kind of gets me thinking. So um, that's, uh, that's my presentation about Lagba Omer. I hope you got a little bit about um, where we even get the idea initially to have a holiday on this day, the earliest sources we have. Um, what are the various possible characters of this day? The very what what kind of holiday is it? Even if we don't know, even if we don't know the origins, and then number three, um, that um, that despite despite the fact that the, the some of the biggest authorities we have, like the Khatam Sofer, um, they, they, don't, they don't know where it comes from. Um, they still seem to accept 
that it is a holiday. Um, and that's worth uh, keeping in mind. Um, now, are there any, before we go, are there any, any other questions or lingering problems or any, any um, jabs you, you want to throw at me? It's like Hassan Sofer is like saying that uh, it's like Minhag Yisrael, like it's just like, okay, you know, who am I to, it's like, it's like taking away Mara because we say it was, you know, Yaakov was, thought it was morning or something. It's like Minhag Yisrael kind of, but I don't know, like, I, like you're saying. Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, at, at first, in that first source, in that tshuva, it sounds like he's saying minhagi, it's kind of like minhagi Israel Torah, he, that, that um, I, I'm willing to, I'm willing to accept that it's a custom, it is a real minhag, therefore, um, I'm not going to, uh, who am I to, to cancel it? But like, it's almost as if he's saying that initially that we'll give it minimal importance. We like, we won't, won't say takhamu that kind of thing, ooh. Um, but, um, but, what I'm, but later on in this other, in his, in his, in his uh, perush on, on, um, the, on, on Parshas Tazria, he, he really takes it a lot further. So that's why I find it, yeah. So it, at, at first it's kind of just a minhag, but maybe it's more than that, I don't know. Right. Um, so if the Chazim Sofer doesn't see anything about the origins, then what about the Minhagim that we all follow for mourning during the Omer? So then do we, if we don't have Lagba Omer and we don't have any real origins for this, and he's basically saying, well, that's whatever, then does that mean we don't really need to follow that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, right, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't really bring anything here which discussed the, the mourning, the, uh, the, the customs of Avelut, of mourning during Sfirat Omer. Um, uh, presumably, I mean, pre look, pre presumably, uh, the Chatam Sofer still would follow those minhagim, but, uh, you know, he's, inter but interestingly, he's saying, even though it's a minhag, he would, he still seems to advise to not eulogize and not fast on that day, which is significant, because, you know, if, if he felt that a fast day is warranted, he davka won't do it on Lagba Omer, and so that, that's, in other words, he's potentially canceling out, canceling out something important, um, so he seems to give a lot of a lot of importance to custom in general, even if he doesn't know where it's from. I mean, that's kind of like the Khatam Sofer's general view. I mean, the Khatam Sofer famously was known for one off-the-cuff expression of Khadashasur Mina Torah. Anything new is forbidden. Um, because so he he was a staunch believer in tradition, even though somewhat slyly he says, I don't really know why. Um, so presumably he would say that the customs of the, the customs of mourning are still are still to be observed, even if. We don't fully understand understand why, but, but anyway, the morning customs are, are already easier to understand from a Talmudic perspective than anything else because the the Gemara and Yivamot does, after all, say that Rabbi Akiva's students died. So, um, does that does that help? Uh, does that help uh, understand things? In other words, he, he's a believer that even if it's a custom that we don't we don't understand, we still have to follow it. That that was kind of his view in general. Oh, so one of you asked in the chat, where do customs of bonfires come from? Um, so, I mean, if I had to theorize, so the short answer is I don't know. But if I had to theorize, maybe it, it, from based on what the Khatam Sofer says, um, he's saying, like, he's talking about how the Jewish soul really takes full, takes root on Lag Baomer. I mean, the... In, very true. I mean, we, we associate fire with neshamas all the time. I mean, we call a yardside candle a ner neshama, after all. There's something about fire which represents the soul. So maybe maybe you would say that the bonfires are about that. I mean, I guess if, if one could be a bit cynical and say the fire is... Uh, people like dancing around bonfires. It's just kind of a, a thing. But, um, but, but, all, but also... Um, but also perhaps the, the fire represents the soul, the burning, the, the soul. I mean, and why Meron, Meron, according to, according to Rabbi Chaim Vital, um, the, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his son, El Azar, are buried in Meron. Their cab, if you go to Meron today, you'll see their graves. Um, that's apparently where they're buried. Uh, Meron, because Meron is, you know, a few hills away from Tzfat. So it's, uh, um, it's, uh, 
so there's some kind of connection there between the Kabbal the Kabbalists in the north. I suppose maybe Tzfat built was built end up be building around Meron. I'm not really sure, but anyway, so Meron is where the Rashbi is buried. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much, Rabbi Berkison. Uh, and if there's any other questions, um, greatly appreciate that really fascinating class. Um,